Well, hello everybody. Hello, this is Zane from Really Easy AI coming at you again. Um, so we're continuing our adventure down the official OpenAI prompt engineering guide. Uh, we're into the section uh, again. Just a reminder: there's six sections. We're I think we're on the third now or the fourth. Uh, and this one's called split complex tasks into simpler subtasks. So we're going to decompose difficult tasks into smaller tasks is essentially the, the goal here. Let me get my stuff going. There we go. So here's what it looks like inside the prompt engineering guide. And of course, I'll have the link to uh, every one of these sections that I show. There's a link to that section. So I have the link to each section as well. So you can go straight to the section if that's what you want to do. Just kind of makes your life a little easier. Uh, but here we can see split complex tasks into simpler subtasks. Uh, just as it is good practice in software engineering to decompose a complex system into a set of modular components, usually functions or, some, or the like, the same is true of tasks submitted to a language model. Complex tasks tend to have higher error rates than simpler tasks. Furthermore, complex tasks can often be redefined as a workflow of simpler tasks in which the outputs of earlier tasks are used to construct the inputs to the next task or later tasks. So we have three tactics here. Uh, use intent classification to identify the most relevant instructions for user query. For dialogue applications that require very long conversations, summarize or filter the previous dialogue. And then summarize long documents piecewise and construct a full summary recursively. So uh, I'm going to warn you up front, this entire section is meant really just for developers. Uh, there's there's very little uh, analog for this approach to just uh, the ChatGPT interface. Now, I will most likely show these techniques uh, later on in the OpenAI API series, but in this series where we're just going through the prompt engineering guide, I want to set your expectations properly. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Ah, coughing up blood, um, uh, but so we'll be. I'll be able to show the first one in ChatGPT, but the other two not so much. Uh, they're a little more complex. All right, so let's jump into it. First things first. I really want you to get your head around the idea here, right? So the idea is we're going to take the output from one prompt and use it as the input for another prompt. So if I've got prompt one get some output, then use it as the input for another prompt, and then use it as an input for another prompt. Now, that's one example. There, th That doesn't get into the subdivision and all that stuff, but this is essentially what we're talking about <clears throat> at a high level. And so now let's illustrate that with some examples. Let's do the first, um, uh, first tactic. Uh, use intent classifications to identify the most relevant instructions for a user query. So, for tasks in which lots of independent sets of lots of independent sets of instructions are needed to handle different cases, it can be beneficial to first classify the type of query, then use that classification to determine which instructions are needed. This can be achieved by defining fixed categories and hard coding instructions that are relevant for handling tasks in a given category. This process can also be applied recursively to decompose a task into stages. The advantage is that each query will contain only those instructions that are required to perform the next stage of a task, which can result in lower error rates compared to using a single query. Um, this can also result in a lower cost since larger prompts cost more to run. Well, yes, the, the cost is not, isn't just really t a token thing because token-wise it's the same, but it's in the loss of information because of the context window. And I'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. All right, so <clears throat> let me let me kind of show you what's going on here. So the idea is pretty simple. We give a system instruction, and then we get a user prompt, and that user prompt then provides a way for us to categorize what it is the user needs based on the classification. Then we programmatically, right, through code, we'll go off and grab or gen automatically generate a new set of prompts that then deal with that specific category that we've designated. In order to achieve this, you first have to 
categorize what it is the user wants. So we're gonna look at that first. Then once you've done that, you take that and you go, oh, okay, it's this major category, this minor category, whatever, whatever, however you categorize it. And then <coughs> you'll have a set of prompts already prepared or you'll dynamically generate prompts to deal with issues in those categories. So let's start with this example. You see here, you'll be provided with, the, this is the system prompt, right? This is all just set up right here. This part is the part the user types in. So the system prompt, you'll be provided with customer service queries, classify each query into a primary category, secondary category, provide your output in JSON format, it just means it's gonna have curly braces and stuff like that. Primary categories, billing, technical support, account management, general inquiry, great. Secondary categories, billing secondary, unsubscriber upgrade, app payment, explanation for charge, disputed charge, technical support, troubleshooting, device compatibility, software updates, account management, password reset, <coughs> update personal info, close account, account security. And again, this you can blow this out. This can be any number of categories here. General inquiry, product information, pricing, feedback, speak to a human. Um, and then we have the prompt, I need to get my internet working again. So let's, um, let's see this in action. I want you to see it. And this is the only one I'll be able to really simulate well uh, using ChatGPT. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate the system prompt first. And I want you to see that in action. So I'm just going to do the system prompt by itself. Give me a second here. Let me grab it. All right. And copy that. And away we go. All right. There's the system prompt. I'm just going to stick it in. And uh, now it's ready. Please provide a customer service query that you'd like for me to classify. So the first customer service query I'm going to say is um, uh, I need to change my password. And then you'll notice it spits it out, account management, password reset. So it chose account management as the primary category. And then for the secondary category, password reset, right? Pretty easy stuff. Um, I'd like to find out about um, your services. All right, general inquiry, product information. See how this is working? So we provide it with these categories to put stuff into, and then when a user asks a question, it will provide us with the primary and secondary categories, so then we can take those categories and have pre-built or dynamically built uh, prompts to deal with that next set of information. Now we're gonna we're gonna do that in just a second. Let me do one more. Uh, we'll use the one the example in the uh, slides there. Uh, I need to get my internet fixed, and then it'll say primary technical support, secondary troubleshooting. Okay, perfect. There we go. So we're gonna run with that one. So let's assume now that programmatically through code we said okay. It's a technical support troubleshooting thing. And then we've pre-built a query now to deal specifically with technical support troubleshooting and probably would have a category under that like type of equipment like router and so on and so forth. But let's just say this is where it ends. So now what we can do is we can look at the second part. And so let's assume we do troubleshooting, you know, uh, we do uh, technical support troubleshooting. And that brings us here to this pre-built query or prompt. You'll be provided with customer service inquiries that require troubleshooting in a technical support context. Help the user by, and then a whole list of stuff to help the user, right? So if it's a particular model number, tell them what to do. If it's this, if it's that. Um, and then at the end we say, if the user starts asking questions that are unrelated to this topic, then confirm if they would like to end the current chat about troubleshooting and classify their request according to the following scheme. And then we actually insert the classification scheme again. So there it is. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna run that now. So I've taken all that, and here it is. Let's see here. Yep, we're good to go. Let me just grab that system prompt. All right. So I'm gonna grab that system prompt. Let's start a new chat. I did not mean to do that. Let's try that again. Okay, no, there we go. All right, so uh, basically I just copied and pasted what you saw before. So 
It's going to ask them to check their cables and all kinds of stuff, right? All the troubleshooting stuff we talked about. So I'm going to run that. It's going to say, give me a, how can I assist you today? I need to get my internet fixed. All right, could you please check that all cables are connected? So that was the first thing we told it to do, right? Up in here we said, ask them to check all cables. Note that it is common for cables to come loose. If all cables are connected and the issue persists, ask them which router model. I'm going to say, okay, um, all my cables are good. All right, could you please tell me the model number of your router? All right, well... We'll assume they've looked it up, or uh, what we should have added is where they can find the model number, because that would be a logical thing to have here. But let's assume that they found it, and it's this model right here. Uh, model number for my router, there you go. For the model number, please follow these steps, and there you go. So you see how this is working? And now I can say, um, I need to talk to someone. Now that has nothing to do with troubleshooting, so let's see what it does with it. And there you go. So it automatically recategorizes it as, uh-oh, well we're done with troubleshooting, now we got general inquiry, speak to a human, and then we would have something that deals with that. There's, there would be code that would read that and go, oh, they wanna speak to a human. Okay, and then connect them you know, to tech chat or whatever, right? Automatically call their phone. Hey, we've got a human here. Whatever it is you want to do. The point being that these categories trigger some code to run to either run more prompts or go off and call tech support or start a chat with tech support, whatever it is you want to do. So this is very much a code-driven type activity, but we've kind of simulated here in ChatGPT so you can see what's going on. Well, this is mostly the realm of code. Now, um, beyond that, now we get into stuff that's just pure code. You really can't, you, you kind of simulate it, but it, I'm just going to use drawings to kind of show you how it works. Uh, these are techniques we would use if we had very large chunks of stuff that we need to work with. And here's the first one. Uh, for dialogue operations that require very long conversations, summarize or filter previous dialogue. So what does that say? Well, since models have a fixed content uh, context length, dialogue between a user and an assistant in which the entire conversation is included in the context window may not continue or will not continue indefinitely. Just can't. Eventually, you're going to run out of space. There are various now. Does everybody know what I mean by context window? That's the amount of, for want of a better term, memory that you're going to have for that chat session, and it varies by models. Some models have more. Some models have less. Um, and so you'll have to adapt accordingly. For ChatGPT4 Turbo, its input context window is 128K, which is pretty large, but not infinite, right? You can still run out. And once you, once you, your chat session goes over 128K, the old stuff goes away. It literally forgets all the old stuff. And we'll see that illustrated here in a picture I, I drew. So anyway, uh, there are various workarounds to this problem, one of which is to summarize previous turns in the conversation. Uh, once the size of the input reaches a predetermined length, this could trigger a query that summarized part of the conversation, uh, and the summary of the prior conversation could be included as part of the system message going forward. So you kind of build this thing dynamically. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. So here we have our context window. And again, if this were uh, ChatGPT4 Turbo, it'd be 128K. But here we have the entire conversation, which clearly is more or bigger than the context window, whatever it is. Everything, so you've got your newer stuff and your older stuff. That's how it works, right? It's first in, first out. So the newer stuff gets put into the context window, but your older stuff that goes beyond the context window is basically just lost conversation. It's gone. You are not going to see it again. So what we're saying is, no, instead of losing it, before you lose it, you have some code that triggers and says, oh, we're about to reach our context window link. Let's go ahead and summarize a chunk of this, put that summary into the system prompt, and then now they can do another whole set of 128K. We might want to summarize that. Boom, system prompt, next set, and just keep doing that. Now, eventually, even that will run out, but at least it's a strategy by which 
we can take these long conversations and summarize them and include those summaries so that we can continue the uh, the overall thrust of the conversation. Obviously, some things are going to get lost when you summarize. That's just how it goes. <sighs> Had to give me some youngling. So that's what we're talking about here. This idea that you would, through code, have a trigger before the end of your context window, summarize maybe everything, I don't know, as much as you want, stick that summary into your system prompt, and then let them keep talking. And then that fills up, summarize, summary in the system prompt and on and on and on it goes so that's essentially what what this is dealing with so you don't lose entire chunks of the conversation because literally once it goes out of the context window it's gone gone you're not getting it back it's, it is forgotten and so that's usually very bad okay now let's talk about the final tactic also code oriented Summarize long documents piecewise and construct a full summary recursively. So this one, since models have a fixed context length that cannot be used to summarize a text longer than the context length minus the length of the generated summary in a single query. So to summarize very long documents, such as a book, we can use a sequence of queries to summarize each section of the document. Section su summaries can then be glued together and summarized producing summaries of summaries get the idea and so we start we build these summaries of summaries of summaries um or you know just take a whole bunch of summaries and build a summary out of that however we want to do it i just show a two-stage summary in, in my next example but this is essentially what we're talking about let's assume we have a long book with chapters we want to summarize it but it's way bigger than our context window so what do we do well, we break it up. We do a chapter one summary, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five summary. Then we put all those together and create a summary of the summaries, which is our overall book summary. So you see how you're creating a summary of the summaries? And that way you're able to summarize essentially the whole book. Again, you're going to get loss of, you know, of very precise words and things that you have. Uh, that's just a given but at least you'll have the overall summary or thrust of the book. So these are all strategies that were meant for developers, as I mentioned at the start. Keep that in mind, but as you go through and as you become a developer, which many of you will, I would hope most of you will, as you continue your journey through the open uh, AI space, right? ChatGPT is the starting point. It's a great starting point. Creating your own GPTs is cool. Then you move on to using the uh, OpenAI API, do some chats, do some assistance, and on and on it goes. But as you continue your journey, these particular techniques will be quite useful. Not as useful as they used to be, and I'll tell you why. <coughs> because while today we have a context window of 128K with ChatGPT4 Turbo, uh, Google has already announced that Gemini 1.5 has a 1 million token context window, input context window. Uh, Claude has announced the same, uh, Anthropics Claude, and I, I expect it will be very soon that uh, OpenAI will announce the same. I think the 1 million token context window is coming. At 1 million tokens of context, you've solved quite a bit of problems in terms of being able to hold on to most. You know, there's that 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, I'd say a good 80% or more of conversations can fit very neatly in that 1 million token context window. And only when you're dealing with very large chunks of data would you have to worry about, continue to worry about not being able to fit in the context window. So this may all be fairly moot, and it actually is kind of moot at this point, um, based on where we see these uh, input context window sizes going. Okay, so that uh, gives us to uh, gets us to the next level. Give the model time to think. We will stop here, and uh, I'll let you guys uh, take a break. And we'll, the next session will be on giving the model time to think. This is Zane. I'll see you next time.